I'm going to talk about pulmonary ultrasound today, and this will include discussion of pulmonary edema, pneumothorax, and pleural effusions. When it comes to differential diagnosis, it's often very difficult to figure out what's going on with a patient who's short of breath. For instance, you have a 56-year-old man with a 60-pack year history of smoking and known poor cardiac function represented by a left ventricular ejection fraction of 35%. This patient presents to the emergency department or to your office with shortness of breath. In this case, what do you, how do you know what's going on? This patient could equally have a CHF exacerbation, could have a COPD exacerbation, and it always boils down to the same dilemma. What's going on and how do we treat them in initially? Often what happens is this patient receives a shotgun approach in which we treat them with NEBS and steroids and antibiotics, but as well as Lasix and after the reduction, and it's not really clear what we're aiming for. There is a lot of evidence surrounding the fact that chest ultrasound can be superior to x-rays for differentiation of CHF and COPD, and there's also evidence that chest ultrasound is superior to our physical exam for, for this as well. Additional evidence uh, supports the use of chest ultrasound in diagnosing multiple um, syndromes, as well as gut procedure guidance um, for the procedures listed here, such as chest tube, pigtail placement, thoracentesis, and so forth. There are really eight key propositions, uh, four on each side of the chest, that we want to scan when we're performing pulmonary ultrasound. The anterior zones, zones one and two, are best for uh, viewing extrapleural air. For instance, when there's a pneumothorax and there's air between the lung and the chest wall, it's going to collect anteriorly in a patient who's supine. So this is the zone where we focus uh, when we're looking for pneumothorax. Posterior and laterally, they're the dependent zones, and in these areas we can best see consolidations and effusions. And in all zones, we should equally be able to see extracapillary lung water, such as is represented in uh, pulmonary edema, both cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic. The probe you choose depends on what you are looking for at the time. For instance, uh, picking the curvilinear probe or the low frequency probe that we use for cardiac imaging, this probe is best for deep views, large views, but not a lot of detail. So for instance, if you're scouting um, how you're going to perform a procedure or how large a patient's effusion is, I would use this probe initially. Also, if you're looking for pulmonary edema to see how deep it goes, you're not going to be able to see beyond six centimeters with a linear probe, so you choose the, um, the phased array probe or the curvilinear probe in this case. A linear probe is best uh, for seeing something superficial when you need a great deal of detail, for instance, looking at the pleural line for evaluation of pneumothorax or to guide procedures in real time, such as thoracentesis. If you're not getting a good image initially, you have to ask yourself a few questions, and these are pretty much the same questions you'd ask for any type of ultrasound. That is, is there air uh, in the way? And that can, air can either be between the probe and the patient when you don't have enough gel, or it can be within the skin, or it can be within the structure itself that you're imaging, such as the lung. Uh, is there pneumothorax? It's therefore a lot of air. Does the patient need to be repositioned to optimize the view of uh, the location of the structure which you're trying to image? And are there any overlying obstructions that need to be removed, such as bandages or EKG uh, leads? We're going to go over the lung anatomy because uh, understanding the, the lung anatomy is important for being able to interpret the different artifacts that we use to help us understand what's going on in the lung during uh, ultrasound imaging of the chest. The normal lung um, has alveolar sacs connecting with the bronchioles and these uh, thin walled. In pulmonary edema, the, you can see that the walls of these alveolar sacs are distended with fluid as well as the sacs themselves are filled with fluid. This is represented um, on ultrasound by artifacts that uh, will reflect the increased lung water. For instance, right here we have the pleural line, sometimes called the VPPI or the visceroparietal pleural interface. Either way, it's where the visceral and the parietal pleura touch, comes all the way up to the chest wall. And 
the interlobular septae se separate the different um, areas of the, of the lung, the alveolar sacs. Those are approximately seven millimeters apart, and that's an important number to remember. You'll see that come up in just a moment. Um, what we're interested in here is, is the lung parenchyma normal or not? What we're asking are, are there A lines present or are there B lines present? What are A lines? A lines are horizontal artifacts that represent reverberations originating from the pleural line. And we'll explain a little bit more about what that means. But A lines represent air. So you can see this in either normal lungs or in pneumothorax situations because when ultrasound beam reaches the pleural line and there's air on the other side of the pleural line, whether it's inside or outside the lung, that beam will be reflected and scattered, reflected somewhat back to the probe. The delay in uh, the reflection back to the probe, the probe interprets that uh, delay as depth. And what ends up happening is you get a reflection of that pleural line equidistant. Here we have the chest wall, we have the ribs, and the rib shadows behind the rib. This is the VPPI, the visceral parietal pleural interface. You'll notice right here we have an A line. Take that away, you'll be able to appreciate. That is not an actual structure, it is a reflection of the pleural line. It is almost always, and it should be, equidistant from the skin, which is where the probe is sitting. The distance between the skin and the pleural line is reflected again from the pleural line down. It's the same distance. This is because these ultrasound beams that come here and get stick, scattered back up to the probe, that delay in return, the probe reads as something deeper. Here's another representation of that concept. Air is not a good transducer of sound, so sound waves will hit this pleural line and scatter when there's air on the other side of the pleural line. What happens, some of these, um, here's the pleural line again, some of these scatter waves reverberate back to the interface and then are reflected as a repetition of that pleural line deeper. So what if there aren't any A lines? Again, A is for air, so in normal lung you should see A lines, but what if there are not A lines? What does that mean? All that means is that something, and we don't know what, has changed in the lung that replaces air with substances that can transmit the sound waves, and that substance can be fluid, blood, pus, contusion, atelectasis. Here's an example of what B lines look like. So B lines are very well-defined vertical artifacts. They tend to obliterate the A lines. Um, if you see small B lines, we call minor B lines right here. This is the pleural line, chest wall. That just is a representation that the visceral parietal pleural interface is up to the chest wall and that the interlobular septae can be seen about seven millimeters apart, typically. There again, there's that seven millimeter mention that we had before. But if you have multiple B lines that go all the way to the edge of the screen and obliterate the A lines, then that is not normal. And more than five in an, in an area is, is very much um, correlating with extravascular lung water or pulmonary edema. Here's an example of what B lines look like. Again, it looks like a light show. You can see the movement with the pleural line moving. You can see the extension all the way to the edge of the screen. Here's another example. Uh, these, these B lines are more confluent, and that probably represents that fluid is not just in the interlobular septa, but also in the alveolar themselves, which tend to be more three millimeters apart. This reverberation occurs because there's a high acoustical impedance difference between the interlobular septa full of water and the air right next to it. So it creates up a side-to-side um, -side reverberation within that interface and creates a a um, comet tail that goes all the way to the edge of the screen. Here's a representation of that. With the ultrasound beam coming down, there's a reflection within the interface, um, that vertical interface where the interlobular septa comes all the way up to the chest wall. And depending on how many reverberations, there are, there are uh, 
infinite number of reverberations and they can extend all the way to the end, edge of the screen. You can see here, again, a representation that 7 millimeters represents typically interstitial edema, the interlobular septae are thickened. And here you have a more confluent edema, and this is really the ultrasound equivalent of what ground glass opacity looks like on a CT scan. So when you have alveolar interstitial disease, the things that you will look for are comet tails or bee lines, anterior or laterally. It should be that you should see them in all fields because pulmonary edema should be diffuse, not one-sided. Um, seven millimeters apart, interstitial edema, three millimeters apart represents alveolar edema, but there's always multiple. If there's only a few or they don't extend all the way to the edge of the screen, that can be normal, especially in dependent zones. For instance, if you've been sleeping on your back all night, you may have a few bee lines uh, towards the back side of your uh, chest. You also will not uh, see the A lines because the B lines that are pathologic will obliterate the A lines. Side by side comparison of B lines and A lines. And another example, some still pictures of what B lines can look like. So what is the ultrasound and chest x-ray relation with beelines? We've heard of curly beelines on a plain film. Here's one represented right there, which shows that the interlobular septa comes up perpendicularly to the chest wall, just as we've represented in a cartoon fashion earlier. And when that ultrasound beam reflects back and forth within this interface and bounces off the air on either side, it creates a artifact all the way down, and when you turn the screen as the ultrasound is oriented, it would appear as a vertical artifact. All right, moving on to ultrasound for pneumothorax. We all know that a pneumothorax means when the visceral and the parietal pleura have separated and that their air has collected between the two layers and therefore allows the lung to collapse. So why don't we just do a chest x-ray for this? This is what we've always done, right? Uh, well, this is a trauma film, so by definition this patient is likely on a backboard and supine. You don't see anything, you don't see a pleural line here, it doesn't look like there's a problem. This patient got a CT scan and here is the finding. Clearly there's a, a very significant left pneumothorax and it was not picked up on the plain film. This is not uncommon, um, depending on which study you look at, that sensitivity of a supine anterior posterior chest x-ray for pneumothorax is somewhere around a coin flip. The best study we could find showed about a 75% uh, sensitivity. However, in comparison to that, ultrasound has been looked at and it appears to be significantly superior to chest x-ray for the supine population, which in the ICU is the majority of our patients, at least you know, mostly recumbent. So the prospective evaluation that was done in emergency literature were blunt trauma patients. Uh, essentially, they looked at CT or rush of air as the gold standard to represent pneumothorax and compared the CT or rush of air with ultrasound uh, ability to pick up the pneumothorax. Chest x-ray here was sensitive, 75% sensitive, but obviously if you saw it, it was there, 100% specific. Um, emergency ultrasound was 98% sensitive and 99% specific. Therefore, the sensitivity is far superior in uh, ultrasound from chest x-ray in this population. If you track out uh, the edges of the, the pneumothorax, which you can see when you find the lung point, which is the point at which the lung drops away from the wall, you can also get a good idea of what size the pneumothorax is. What we do is we play, use the linear probe because we want to see the pleural line. It's very superficial. You need to see that detail. And you place the probe in the um, cephalocaudad orientation with the indicator towards the head. And you essentially march down the chest uh, looking at the pleural line as you go, avoiding the, the edge of the heart. And what you're looking for um, are a couple different markers. What we're looking for is the pleural line to be sliding. So we find the pleural line that we found before um, when we were looking at A lines, and what we're looking for that sliding sign. Um, we'll show, I'll show you some examples of that shortly. You're also going to be looking for something we call Sky Ocean Beach, which is an artifact. Actually, not an artifact, it's a representation um, seen when you use the M mode, which is the motion mode. So what we have here is a still picture. We have a rib, we have a rib, shadow behind, the pleural line. And this is that A line we were talking about before. So this is a still picture, so you can't appreciate sliding, obviously, in a still picture. 
but just to remind you of the anatomy here, the pleural interface you can see, and if it is moving, you will see some sliding. Um, you might see some minor B lines to show you that the interlobular septa are adjacent, are coming up all the way to the chest wall. Um, and you may see some A lines or not, depending on how much pulmonary edema there is. However, when there's a pneumothorax, this whole interface is affected and it can create some significant changes. So here's a representation of a linear probe with the indicator towards the head. If you use the second intercostal space midclavicular line and watch through several respiratory cycles, um, you will notice <clears throat> that at this pleural interface, you'll be able to appreciate that sliding. It appears as uh, ants marching or shimmering at that interface. The air in the lung beyond that interface um, impairs the transmission of sound. So unless the lung is fairly consolidated or full of fluid, you won't see um, the lung itself. You might see some A lines, you might see some B lines, but the pleural interface is very visible and you can see that movement. However, when there's a pneumothorax, the lung will fall away from the chest wall. And you can see that the ultrasound beam basically gets cut off right at that interface because there, it encounters air. And the visceral and the parietal pleura are no, no longer touching, so you will no longer be able to see that motion at that pleura line. Here's an example of a sliding sign. So clearly you have the ribs and the shadow behind the ribs. And what we appreciate in the middle is the uh, lung sliding at the pleural interface right here. You can also appreciate these minor B lines, which are representations of the uh, of the interlobular septa coming up to the chest wall in a perpendicular fashion. Here's a pneumothorax in contrast. We have ribs, we have the rib shadows, and we have the pleural line, but there is no motion appreciated at that line. You also have lost the minor B lines. You no longer see a representation of the interlobular septa coming up to the chest wall. You do have an A line here, which you're not going to lose necessarily because A means air. And again, air can be either inside the lung or outside the lung. So is this lung sliding? Here you have muscle, rib, rib, pleural line. Do you see the shimmering ants marching along? And you can see these minor perpendicular projections or minor B lines. So now what we mentioned before is the Sky Ocean Beach that we're looking for is if you place an M mode, this is the M mode button, press it once, position your M mode line between the two ribs across the pleural line, press it again, and you will get basically a representation of everything that is going on at that line over several seconds. The seashore sign, when the M mode is through that line, on this half, you see basically skin and soft tissue in striped fashion, pleural line, and then you see this graininess, which beyond it looks like a beach. So basically waves coming onto a beach. However, when you have loss of this pleural lung motion, side to side motion below it, you basically just see stripes all the way down, or what we call a barcode. Um, so pneumothorax would be bicar but, uh, a bar barcode, excuse me, and the regular lung, the lung that is basically not collapsed, would have the seashore sign. So here's several examples. The M mode line running through the pleural line, M mode over several minutes, over several seconds. You have the stripe based because this basically is a reflection of everything that's happening on, along this line in the muscle layer. So you have some striped you know, striations to that. The bright white pleural line, which is right here, and then as the, as the lung moves back and forth with breathing, you get this back and forth graininess. So it appears uh, it's like waves coming onto a beach, sky, ocean, beach. On the other hand, with the pneumothorax, you can see the stripes of the muscle, the pleural line, the bright white area. You can see the A line even right here, but you do not see that back and forth grainy motion of the lung moving back and forth. So this is sky ocean without a beach or barcode sign. So what do we have here? As you can see, there is no grainy, uh, gran granular, sand-like appearance, and this looks like a barcode. So this would represent a pneumothorax.
Side-by-side -side comparison of the appearance of a seashore sign with the appearance of a barcode sign. And again, pneumothorax can have A lines but will not have B lines. In this example, which side is positive? Right. So there is a positive pneumothorax in the image on the right, which shows the barcode, and the image on, uh, actually the image on the left of the screen that you're seeing right here, positive pneumothorax, and here we have the Sky Ocean Beach, negative pneumothorax. And again, last examples, which one is positive? Right, so the negative pneumothorax again, Sky Ocean Beach. I mentioned earlier the uh, lung point, and the lung point is, um, is actually 100% specific for pneumothorax. If you see this, then you have a pneumothorax. There's nothing else that does this. So the lung point is the, uh, where the lung falls away from the chest wall. If you can capture that exact point, during respirations what you'll see is uh, times when the lung slides into the picture where it is uh, attached and times when the lung is moving back and forth where you can see that it's dropped away and you lose the sliding and you get you lose the B lines and you get A lines. So really this is the boundary between normal lung and pneumothorax visualized in the same uh, frame. This would be, uh, for instance, if you found this, uh, if your ultrasound beam was placed right at this spot where the lung dropped away, you would see what we just appreciated, where during some part of the respiratory cycle the lung is touching and some part it's not. And if you place an M mode line down through that exact space, you'll see kind of a back and forth uh, across your screen where you'll have barcode, seashore, barcode, seashore all the way across. So a couple caveats, uh, sliding sign can be absent in conditions other than pneumothorax. Anything which would not allow the lung to move very easily, the visceral and parietal pleura interface to not move against each other easily can cause um, lack of sliding. However, if you do the Sky Ocean Beach M mode, you should still be able to appreciate Sky Ocean Beach in a, an old patient who does not have a pneumothorax. Things that can interfere with the appreciation of sliding sign is an effusion because obviously fluid gets between the two um, pleura. Uh, consolidation with adhesions, for instance, inflammatory pneumonia where there's adhesions. Prior pleuridesis. Um, chest tubes which can tack the lung down and not allow it to move uh, very easily. And especially if there's pleuridesis in the past. And advanced COPD where there's some adhesions and bullous lesions. These things can all create um, false positives for, for pneumothorax if you just use sliding sign. Okay, moving on from pneumothorax to appreciation of pleural fluid, pleural effusion evaluation. This probe uh, should be the low frequency probe um, because you want to see more deeply than six centimeters. You want to see almost all the way to the spine, so you choose the low frequency probe, which gives you high penetration but not a great deal of detail. You place the probe um, at the mid-axillary line with the indicator towards the head. And what you see, the orientation marker would be towards the head, right here. What you see, um, this particular clip is interesting because it's toggling back and forth between two different probes in the same, in the same, um, with the location, the probe at the same spot. This is the low frequency probe, sorry, high frequency probe. This is the low frequency probe. So here you can see um, the spot at which the diaphragm comes up against the wall, and then there's the thoracic space on this side and the abdominal space on this side, and this bright white line is the diaphragm. So this is the spot where we just were, and you never quite can tell um, where a patient's diaphragm is until you look. For instance, our CP COPD patients, their diaphragms can be quite low. Um, our atelectatic patients, their diaphragms can be almost all the way in their axilla, so you just have to start where you think it might be and then uh, move up and down until you find that interface where you're getting in one picture both the thoracic and the abdominal compartments separated by the diaphragm. So here's an example again. This is a curvilinear probe with indicator towards the head, the diaphragm, the liver and the kidney, and on this side of the diaphragm you see black 
black represents fluid. It's the anechoic uh, nature of fluid. And so this would be a representation of what plural fluid appears like. What, hap what does it look like if there's not plural fluid there? Well, there's an artifact that we count on to tell us that there's not plural fluid there, and this artifact is represented here. So here we have the liver, the kidney, the diaphragm, and on the other side of the diaphragm it looks like there's more liver. This is what we call a mirror image artifact. Um, what happens is ultrasound waves come and glance or hit the diaphragm, and they cannot go through the diaphragm if there's air on the other side. They cannot um, be transmitted. So those waves are will basically skate along the diaphragm and come back up to the probe in a delayed fashion. And because to the probe, to the machine, time is distance, time is depth, then that delayed signal coming back through the liver appears as if there's liver deeper on the image. So, if you can imagine this ultrasound beam coming through, sca skating off, coming back up to the probe, and the probe thinking, oh, that looks like liver, but it looks like it's down here. Then you end up seeing what looks like liver on the other side, and you can even see the, ve the vessels and everything else. So how do we know this is not hepatization of the lung, or very consolidated lung? There's a couple things that we look at in this. One is um, what we call the spine sign. And here are the vertebral shadows, and if you see them, you know, solid organs will transmit ultrasound waves deep. So the vertebral shadows are able to be seen all the way up until you hit the diaphragm. But when there's air trying to transmit the ultrasound beam, air basically obliterates, scatters the entire beam, and nothing can be seen beyond it. So you lose the vertebral shadow right there at the diaphragm. And so if you lose your vertebral shadow, then you know that there's air. If you don't have um, anechoic space on the other side of the diaphragm, then you know that there's air. So which one is normal? Exactly. This is your normal mirror sign right here, and here you have that anechoic fluid. You can't really see the uh, spine sign in this particular depth because it's not quite deep enough. But the presence of this black anechoic fluid on the other side of the diaphragm is uh, representative of fluid. And if you're a trauma population, then you would say hemothorax, but in our medical population, oftentimes this is just a, an effusion or transudative or exudative. So how do we know what type of effusion it is? Is it transudative, exudative, blood? Some of it depends on the clinical scenario. The size doesn't really tell you. Um, the, uh, the color of it may tell you, because transudate tends to be solid black and homogenous, but exudate could have loculated features of fibrin floating around in it, and hemothorax tends to develop what appears like a hematocrit or some dependent debris within. But that's not 100% reliable. We can't really tell the size of an effusion. Um, most studies agree that small or large effusions are very difficult to quantify. In between effusions, if you multiply the, the centimeters by, um, or excuse me, the millimeters by 20, that gives you an estimate of about how much fluid is there. But really, on the extremes of the scale, it's hard to, it's hard to predict exactly. In general, effusions that are large enough to cause compromise can be easily seen. Here's some examples of what uh, different effusions may look like. Um, here's the fluid with all these fibrinous exudate, and basically this is an exudative effusion, empyema in fact, and you have this fibrin throughout. Transudate with a, here you can see a good example of the spine sign going beyond the diaphragm because there's fluid here to transmit the ultrasound beam. And um, this is a hemothorax, a little difficult to see, but there's a hematocrit layered within. So when we use the ultrasound to guide our procedures, we first take a look with the phase debris probe and see how large and where the effusion is and what type of effusion it is to help us guide what, how we're going to drain it. Is this going to be chest tube? Is this going to be needle thoracostomy? Is this going to be pigtail? We might be able to tell from seeing loculations that you know, needle thoracostomy is not going to be adequate, for example. But when we're actually doing the procedure and want to guide ourselves in real time, we can use the um, linear probe because we want to be able to see exactly where the rib is, how many centimeters down until you hit the fluid, how deep is the fluid pocket. Um, of course this should be sterile technique. And you know, here's a great example of why we use ultrasound because if you are tapping out the lung to figure out where the dullness is, to figure out where the fluid is, well let's say the fluid is layering here. Well the dullness you're hearing may be lung, 
it, uh, that is fluid. It might be spleen, it might be liver, it might be kidney. You don't really know if you're sticking your needle in this region and you're not sure exactly where the diaphragm or where the fluid is, then you may be inadvertently performing a liver or spleen biopsy. Okay. See my needle. So sometimes it takes two operators depending on your kit. You just incorporate someone else in your field. This person should have a mask on. Uh, okay. Here is an example of how you can be basically watch in real time what's going on. Moving on to pneumonia. This is uh, something that's been going on in Europe for years. Is the evaluation of uh, parenchymal lung disease with ultrasound. And we're just now adopting this in the, in the states and becoming more comfortable with the fact that chest x-ray is not the only test that we can use to determine position, location, extent of pneumonia. So what is consolidation, loss of aeration of the lung for any number of reasons? Um, it can be you know, atelectasis, consolidation, contusion, and so forth. But the fact that the lung consolidates and loses its air means that it can then transmit ultrasound waves, whereas before, the air would scatter the, the beam. So what does lung tissue look like when it's consolidated? You know, the more fluid there is, the wider the lung appears. The, um, basically, right here, this is atelectasis. You can see the tracheal deviation. But if you place your probe here, you would actually be able to see the lung because the air has been moved apart. And what we look for are um, we can see air bronchograms, which are the bright white lines of the connective tissue within the lung. They tend to be hyperechoic, and they tend to be horizontal. Um, hepatization, and what we mentioned previously, is when the lung is so consolidated it looks like liver, but in this case you know it's not liver because you don't see the portal vessels running through it. Um, you don't see the uh, hepatic veins draining into anything, and you also are able to see the spine beyond uh, the diaphragm. So here's some examples. Um, in about 90% of the cases, you can actually see a, a consolidated area of lung. This lo lung looks grayscale, dark gray. It has these horizontal white hyperechoic lines throughout, which represent the uh, bronchograms. And um, the, liver, the lung itself is starting to look like liver. Here's another example where the lung can be seen. There's fluid all around. The lung is consolidated, but you can actually see. And you can see some bright white splayed um, horizontal and perpendicular lines throughout which represent the, the connective tissue. Normal lung versus pneumonia. You, lo you lose that A-line appearance. You don't have the B-lines necessarily, but you can. But this actually looks like solid organ with, again, these horizontal bright white lines throughout. Here's a, a fluid bronchogram right there. You can see both walls of the bronchi with the fluid in between, the black in between. And rarely, but we do sometimes place color Doppler over this area and show the increased vascularity to the, the, the infected or consolidated areas of the lung. Ultrasound's also been used to identify abscess. Within the lung, it's usually very circumscribed well, and discrete, sometimes with some fibrin or exudate in the dependent area. Here's a great example of um, one of our French colleague, French Canadian colleagues uh, offered this of the air bronchogram, the, the bronchial tree visible within the lung. So to summarize, the really uh, the pulmonary ultrasound is is not new. It's just newly appreciated, and we're adapting it now to appreciate uh, pulmonary edema, pneumothorax, pleural effusions, consolidations, and multiple other etiologies to help us guide our therapies and get the correct therapy to the patient in real time. You should look at all eight areas of the chest because different areas are good for diff you know, different etiologies and different pathologies. Um, comet tail artifacts can be normal if they're few and not uh, all the way to the edge of the screen, but if there's multiple all the way to the edge of the screen, then that, um, some say greater than three, others say for sure greater than five, then that is pathologic and representative of extravascular lung water, either cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic. And if you have diffuse positivity um, on both sides, again, that is something that would represent pulmonary edema. In a, the more advanced lecture, if you go to advanced pulmonary lecture in the same series, you'll learn more about how do we interpret position of A-lines and B-lines to represent different pathologies such as ARDS and um, fibrosis.
to look at alveolar interstitial disease, uh, just a reminder that the pleural line is that should be where B lines originate. They should go all the way to the edge of the screen and obliterate or mostly obliterate the A lines. And the summary of the pneumothorax, you have in a pneumothorax absence of sliding, absence of minor B lines, you can have A lines, and when you use the M mode, you're going to have a barcode sign. Whereas in normal lung, you have sliding, you may have A lines, you can some often see minor B lines, um, and with the M mode, you're going to see Sky Ocean Beach. So when you practice the hands-on sessions for, for lung ultrasound, you should focus on finding A lines with both the linear and the um, phased array probe. You should look for lung sliding with both probes and look at all eight quadrants of the chest. Find out where the diaphragm is on patients. Look at the mirror image artifact if you have a normal patient or the fluid uh, if you have a patient with fluid in the thoracic cavity. And while you're in that area, take a look also at the relationship of the spleen, kidneys, gallbladder, and heart.